media giant in, in particular. And our first speaker is Oleg, Oleg uh, Toldatov. Oleg is a PhD researcher at the uh, Bocconi University in Milan, Italy. He used to work as a lawyer at the European Con Court of Human Rights and as a legal advisor at the Council of Europe. Uh, and he will talk about blogger law and online freedom of expression in Russia. Take it from here. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And well, it seems that this whole panel will be about best practices. And it's so ironic that my first uh, uh, talk here will actually be about a bad practice, about a failed piece of legislation. At the time I was submitting this abstract, this was still a law in action. And then since it, it became rescinded, and now it's uh, superseded by another legislation. Hence, I also changed the name a little bit uh, because not only the human rights experts and you know, liberal opposition in Russia were very critical of the law I'll be talking about, uh, but then in 2017, actual uh, representatives of internet governance bodies in Russia also started criticizing this law, which was at that point still in action. Uh, but before moving on to the actual law, I'll make some introductory remarks. Indeed, I have worked in the, in the um, European Court of Human Rights and the local expert in the ECHR on all things Internet is Judge Robert Spano uh, from Iceland. I don't know whether anyone knows him, but he uh, loves introducing the topic of Internet governance by giving these two approaches to internet regulation, the absolute libertarian approach and the social accountability approach. And what he loves saying is that right now it seems that the only way to move forward is to follow the social accountability approach, that internet is not something sui generis, that human rights should apply equally online and offline. And uh, in this way, he is, um, basically following in the footsteps of uh, Professor Goldsmith, who in 1998, like 20 years ago now, said in his essay against cyber anarchy that uh, transactions in the internet involve people in the real world exchanging uh, real world goods, which can sometimes cause real world harms. Uh, which brings us to the real world regulation of the, of the internet domain. Uh, in many ways, the regulator's perspective on the internet, and I think today we've already touched upon all the levels of, of this, uh, is to my, in my view, three prone. We have big telecom and government owned cable infrastructure. And of course, there are some international law instruments on that. There is this convention on one, the water sea cabling, uh, there is also all the way the parts of the internet communicate with each other and this is also part of the legislative uh, technique when, whenever the legislator is regulating this. Then there are last mile uh, internet service providers. Those are uh, basically the companies that own the little black box, the, the router in your home where you plug in your cable to get internet. And then there are, of course, end users interac interacting with each other. And it seems that, at least from the perspective of human rights, the regulation mostly happens on the first two levels, on the level of end users and their rights, and on the levels of what can and what cannot internet service providers on the last mile do. Which brings us to another big question, the question of anonymity online. And, uh, well, there are two very distinct uh, ways to talk about anonymity online. Um, we can talk about the anonymity of dissemination of information and then usually people only speak about free speech aspect of it. So if we talk about European Convention of Human Rights, it's Article 10. If we talk about the US Constitution, it's the First Amendment. And then uh, there is access, anonymous access to information, not just any access, which also brings us into the domain of the right to privacy and all the other uh, connected rights. And in this regard, um, it's still unclear, there is still an ongoing deba debate whether there is a right to remain anonymous on the cyberspace. Uh, like the example that is very, very common is Brazil, the country in which constitution there is no right to anonymous free speech. 
So I've spent this, this summer doing research in San Paulo University, and you know, the lawyers there are concerned that this is the way to go. This is how we protect people from defamation. This is how we make both the real world and the internet a free space, uh, free from harm, free from uh, um, anything that can potentially be harmful for the society. Uh, so when it comes to dissemination, anonymity is, is a big debate. When it comes to access, so far, not many countries have proper technical means to actually look at who is accessing the information on the internet. Um, there, of course, sometimes needs to look at uh, who is accessing, but you never know who is behind the computer. You never know who is tapping the www address. Um, and then, of course, whenever we're talking about anonymity and dissemination of information, there is a question of terrorism. And David Kay, who has already been uh, cited a lot, he is of the opinion, which I completely share, and I guess everyone in this room does, that efforts to counter violent extremism and terrorism, they can be the perfect excuse for both democratic and authoritarian governments around the world to restrict free expression and to seek to control access to information. Which brings us to Russia and its struggles, not only with terrorism, but in general uh, with democratic processes. The country has a very unique, periodically hostile relationship with Europe and the West in general. So on and off Cold War. Um, then there is a historically established tendency towards authoritarian government. And then, of course, there is the desire to preserve the territorial integrity of Russia as the biggest, uh, at least in territorial terms, country in the, in the world. And yeah, I must do a disclaimer here. I am Ukrainian myself, so no. I am a bit <laughs> critical of some things that are happening with our dear neighbor. Uh, but yeah, well, it is what it is. Um, but then, of course, there is a region of... Uh, Northern Caucasus with Chechnya, where officially the war sort of kind of ended in 2009, but in fact there is still insurgency going on. And uh, this, this war is also spilling over uh, to the countries neighboring. And uh, there are quite a lot of activists there embracing radical Islam and using terrorism as one of their ways to achieve their goals. Um, the country since 2002 had a lot of counterterrorism measures, specifically online and more general. The more general one was the extremism law of 2002. From that time it had countless revisions. But the biggest problem with the extremism law of 2002 is the definition of extremism in this law. I won't cite it here, it's in, in the paper that is distributed, but it's way too vague. And this is the view of the Venice Commission of the, of the Council of Europe. Basically, under that definition, everything can be defined as extremism, and that is a problem. Because if you're then trying to block websites without a warning, um, store data, and then try to sift it for information concerning extremism, um, you have to define what you're looking for. If the definition is way too broad, then you're basically covering everything. Uh, in 2012, 2016, there was a number of laws that are called Yarovaya's laws or Lugavoy's laws that attempted to completely regulate the internet domain in Russia. So yeah, the first one was about the website blocks with immediate effect. There is this internet authority now in Russia called Roskomnadzor. Um, which is sort of an internet watchdog. And it can, without a warning and without a court decision, block websites, which is a rather big deal. Uh, then 2014 brings us to the law I'm going to talk in a bit more detail later on. It brought compulsory registration of all bloggers, and the blogger is just defined as a person who has a page in the internet. So it, it's not a very uh, specific definition with more than 3,000 visits a day. And then all the databases containing the data of Russian citizens have to be stored on servers physically in Russia. This norm... Has a page in the internet, 
Huh? Any company may have a, a page. Exactly. That's well. That, that's the point because um, we'll we'll come to this later. But um, database is containing the data that Russian citizens have to be stored on servers physically in Russia, which meant that s some companies, for example, LinkedIn, had to exit Russia because they didn't want to comply with this. In in China. It was fine. LinkedIn actually rebuilt their infrastructure from the ground up just for Chinese version of LinkedIn. Not in Russia, though. Uh, then 2016 saw probably one of the wildest laws, which was blanket data storage by internet service providers. And when I say data, it's not just metadata, like who made the ISP call to whom. I mean all the data, including the content. And this law enters into force in 2018. And I think that by now, by 2017, there is still not enough storage space on all the hard drives in the world to make this feasible. Like the, the biggest um, operator, uh, cell phone operator in Russia, uh, MTS, they said that they have to forego their profits for 100 years, starting from now on, to be able to afford blanket data storage for six months and uh, metadata storage for three years, as prescribed by this law. Uh, and then, interesting thing would be that investigative authorities would be able to access such data retroactively. So it's not like you're saying, well, we'll wiretap you based on the court decision. No, you're wiretapped all the time. And then, if necessary, the investigative authorities will go back and uh, kind of uh, look into all your uh, correspondence. So by privacy, I guess. Then in 2017, there is this new law, which is the anonymizer ban, which, well, we discussed. I guess it will also apply to Tor, although the way it will work is still very unclear. And uh, but it's already in force from the 1st of November. So. We already seen the first month of effectiveness, although it's unclear how it is being wor uh, it's it's working now. And then from the first uh, January 2018, we'll have obligatory registration of all messaging services of the users of all messaging services, which it it not only speaks about things like WhatsApp or Viber or Facebook Messenger. Uh, you'll have to give your I think phone number, but the mechanism is still unclear because it's still the, the law is not in action. Uh, from what I understood from the comments of legislators, this will also applies apply to messaging inside computer games. So, like, good luck, for example, tracking all the users of World of Warcraft uh, in Russia and all the other uh, free protocols that provide messaging services. We'll see. Interesting times. Uh, so. I'm going to return to one of the laws, the one that I'm uh, uh, particularly interested in, the, the law that introduced the bloggers register. Um, what it meant is that real identity of the blogger had to be uh, provided to Roskomnadzor. Uh, and then the blogger also had to provide real world contact info and true real world name to all the visitors. So basically, the page had to have a contacts with the email. This is how it got interpreted. And then the rules similar to those in place for media outlet had to be observed. Well, in fact, um, you, you said that there is a problem with corporate blogs. It seems that this law was mostly uh, target targeting uh, individuals, not, uh, not legal persons. But there were several companies that actually didn't want to comply and they exited. Like, I think Intel stopped publishing their Russian version website after this, or like part of their uh, Russian uh, language website. Uh, the whole thing is that this law, as many of the laws we see here, uh, was not targeted, in my view at least, because I'm speculating here, uh, to be 100% effective. The point was to make almost everyone guilty of, of breaking it. And then to lean on someone if necessary, if, uh, if the times called for it. For it. Uh, at the time of the introduction, the non-compliance uh, could result in an administrative fine of up to around $15,000. And then, of course, you could get blocked. <coughs> Um, and then observing rules similar to those in place for media, well, of course, there are, you know, good faith blogging obligations. Um, but this also meant verification of information 
etc., uh, etc., et without the same protections as the journalists are afforded, because bloggers were not deemed journalists. And um, basically what it meant is that pseudonymous blogging, uh, which is widely used in lawful context, was now impossible in Russia for the last three years. Quite a lot of professors, for example, like to blog pseudonymously because they don't want their blogging uh, affect their <laughs> academic life. And then there are a lot of collective blogs where it's really hard to share responsibility for something. How would you report yourself if you're a collective blog? Then the huge problem is, of course, the assessment of daily readership. Of course, if you are running your own website on your own server, then it's rather easy to have counters, although they're also prone to abuse and mistakes. Uh, but if you're using a popular platform, the only statistics you're going to get is the statistics that the platform supplies to you, uh, which might or might not be accurate, and which might or might not report accurately the numbers of unique daily visitors, the numbers of daily visitors, the numbers of repeat visitors, etc., etc. Because it's a very vague concept, daily visitor. If I am you know, a fan of a pop star, and in one day I check the page 3,000 times waiting for updates, does, does it mean that the page has 3,000 visits or not? At the same time, there is also a probability of abuses. First, DDoS attacks on, on a particular website, which means that basically I, I want an army of bots to, to just go there and try to take it down by uh, overloading the, the processing capacity of the, of the server. Allocated, and then there are also flash mobs, and this is actually a real-life example. Next, next slide, we'll see this. When people just decide to go on the social networking page of someone, and social networking pages were also under the umbrella of this law, and you know, like a certain post, or this this may be done maliciously. You know, so, uh, let's say a person in school is being abused by classmates, and they decide to make the life of this person even more miserable by flash mobbing on his or her page and by overloading it with comments. Does this make this cool person uh, a popular blogger suddenly? Mm. A person who can potentially become a, a person spreading uh, terrorism-related information? Well, I guess not. Then, of course, there are cross-border and cross-jurisdictional implications. Well, I don't want to blog from Russia, and uh, what would stop me from having a blog on uh, some weird location um, hosting my, my stuff in, in a weird country and not disclosing my identity to anyone and always doing this through Tor or VPN? How, how will you track me as a popular blogger in Russia then? Of course you can block me, but tracking is a bit problematic. And then, as I've already mentioned, no journalistic protections for bloggers, which was also a bit of a problem. So let's go to the success stories. There was this 11-year-old guy who became one of the entries in the bloggers register because of flash mob. So he apparently was sort of a geeky, dorky 11-year-old with huge problems in his social life. And uh, this was a nice flash mob. His classmates decided to support him and to make him an internet personality. And eventually his mother said, well, we have to go and register with state watchdog because he's way too popular now. And he was one of the entries. And by the way, in three years, there were less than 4,000 entries in the whole register. So it's not uh, something that became hugely used. But there was this guy. And then there was this also um, interesting um, um, alien cartoon character. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess it's cute. Uh, <laughs> which also got registered just in case. Uh, as a popular blogger. Um, in the end, when uh, this liberal opposition organization called Roskom Svoboda uh, were analyzing the content of the register on the day it was closed, it appeared that the overwhelming majority of all the bloggers there were media personalities that had, of course, nothing to do, not with you know extremist views, but even with politics per se. So the whole concept of this blogger's register was sort of lost in translation. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, the law was rescinded in 2017. The register was abolished. Over this three years, there was not a single reported high-profile case involving prosecution for non-compliance with the law. And well, the question is, would actually terrorists or that, that are using blogs 
try to coordinate their attacks or incite hatred via blogs, which is rather unlikely. And if they are, how likely they would be to self-report on themselves and register with the internet watchdog in the country they're in. Um, I am saying no reported high-profile cases, but I, I try to, to search everywhere. There are no even low-profile cases. From what I understand, there was not a single prosecution, but apparently there were a lot of bloggers who were still uh, kind of on a thread because they were breaking the law. And in the first couple of months, there were also a lot of fake reports. So the, the, the blogger didn't want to be entered into the register, but someone on his or her behalf uh, just uh, submitted information to Roskomnadzor because there was no even single factor authentication to, to prove that the person who is registering is indeed the person who is <coughs> registering. I'm almost done. So the question is, where will Russia move forward from this? It seems that they would move from denomination of internet personalities in the blogger's law to denomination of more or less everyone using communication technology with this law which um, makes it illegal for ISPs. I have to be very careful here because we discussed this and apparently um, make it illegal for internet service providers to uh, allow filtered anonymized traffic through their uh, infrastructure capacity. Does anyone understand what this means? Basically, this means that anonymizers are illegal, but not for the users of the internet. They're illegal for internet service providers. Internet service providers have to report the use of anonymizers to Roskomnadzor, who should take the right measures. The user is not involved at this point. The user can use VPN, but then he's doing something that might get his ISP into trouble. And then the ISPs should kind of stop uh, making it possible for the users to use anonymizers. So far, there are a lot of people in Russia who still use VPNs and uh, Tor to access whatever content that they want. And there is a need for this because apparently Roskomnadzor also has this general blacklist on which there are quite a lot of websites, including almost all the liberal opposition websites that are in Russia. So you cannot access a lot of their websites. Like the, the biggest opposition person right now, Navalny, I think his, his website is not accessible via normal means from, from the Russian territory. But you can, at least, at least the, the Russian mirror of it. Um, so this brings me to why I have the Red Queen from uh, Alice behind the looking glass here. Uh, there is a moment there in the, in the book where everyone is running, including Alice, but they're not getting anywhere. And uh, Alice asks Red Quinn, uh, what, what is wrong, what is happening? We're running as fast as we can, but we are still on the same spot. In my country, if you run so fast, you'll definitely get somewhere. And the Red Queen answers, well, your country is a slow sort of country. In our country, just to stay on the single place, you have to run as fast as possible, and to get somewhere else, you have to run twice as fast. This is my liberal interpretation, anyhow. Uh, and this is uh, called the uh, Red Queen metaphor. It's used mostly in um, uh, evolutionary biology, uh, where biologists describe how parasites and hosts adapt to each other. Uh, like the parasite uh, tries to suck blood of, of a mammal, and then the mammal has some uh, response which makes it impossible. And then the parasite adapts, and the mammal adapts again. And this is the race where no one gets further. And in, in my view, with all those laws that I had on the previous slide, uh, Russia is kind of now engaged into the Red Queen's race with the internet users. And there are already talks of how to make Tor more widespread in Russia or how to go even further and make mesh networks a viable alternative to the internet if the internet gets cut down or behind the big Chinese firewall. So in the end, this is a Red Queen's race with no clear winner. <coughs> but a lot of money is being spent on initiatives similar to those that I was talking about right now that in the end was criticized even by the legislators. So I guess this can be a good uh, conclusion and let's hope that whoever of you has influence on the legislators, you can tell those guys, please don't just try to regulate the internet, do it with your brains. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oleg. And now I'm